The next thing to talk about then is synaptic transmission. So if you've got these chloride channels opening, these potassium channels opening in the postsynaptic neuron, or these sodium channels opening up in the postsynaptic neuron, how did that signal get to them to open up? And it's really a fairly simple process we're going to outline here. Basically on your drawing in class, you can either draw the figures or you can write it out. It all begins at getting to plus 30. You'll notice down here I've got plus 30, that's a key number. So when this action potential goes down, we make the presynaptic neuron plus 30. When the presynaptic neuron gets to plus 30, now there's a voltage-dependent calcium channel. So it's almost the same as the potassium channel and the sodium channel as far as it's got a small little gate that slides out when the channel gets to plus 30 and calcium can come in. When calcium comes in, it opens up neurotransmitter vesicles. You notice these small little circles are filled with black dots. Those black dots represent neurotransmitter and the little circles represent something called synaptic vesicles. When calcium binds to the synaptic vesicles, they open up. Normally they're pinched closed, and they can just open a small little bit, and they're going to release their neurotransmitter, and they're going to bind to ligand-gated channels, the same kind of channel we talked about over here, ligand-gated channels. When the neurotransmitter binds to those ligand-gated channels, they open up, and in this case, they let sodium in. Over here, in the case of the cons and IPSPs, they let chloride come in or potassium leave. Now, there's one more critical thing release enough neurotransmitter to stimulate every postsynaptic receptor once and only once. So every receptor gets one neurotransmitter molecule, and then you have to get rid of the rest while those stimulated receptors are doing what they do. There's three ways that you get rid of the rest. And it's important to understand these processes because we have pharmacological interventions. We can give drugs that affect these processes. So just a little bit more closer of a look. The first process I'll talk about is something called reuptake. And so after we release all that extra neurotransmitter, one way we can get rid of it is to take it back, back up into the presynaptic terminal, and that's called reuptake. One of the reasons this is important is because this is what SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or antidepressants do. They inhibit this process, and they leave the serotonin in the cleft longer constantly stimulating the postsynaptic receptors. As this effect of the drug takes place almost immediately, within hours of taking the drug, but maybe most of you know that antidepressants generally don't start working for two, three weeks at a minimum after taking the drug. So it's clearly not leaving the serotonin in the cleft that has the antidepressant effect. It's thought that that serotonin left there causes the body to say to these serotonin receptors, I'm being stimulated too much, so I'm going to take some of those away and it's the taking away of those serotonin receptors that has an antidepressant effect, and that process is what takes two to three weeks. Another mechanism in different synapses is enzymatic breakdown, so I've got this small little circle, which is supposed to represent an enzyme, and it can grab onto any neurotransmitter that hasn't found a receptor, and basically break it down. This is going to occur mainly in a synapse between a motor neuron and a muscle, and sometimes there's a disorder called myasthenia gravis, where that receptor that's supposed to pick up the neurotransmitter gets eaten away at by the body's own immune system. And one way you can give a drug to fight that is to inhibit the enzyme. If you inhibit the enzyme, the neurotransmitter sticks around longer. So even though there's less receptor, the muscle still gets stimulated and you don't get paralyzed as fast or the muscle weakness is attenuated a little bit. The third mechanism of getting rid of excess neurotransmitter is some of it just diffuses out of the synaptic cleft area. The last thing to talk about are what are the different types of neurotransmitters and this is an oversimplification to be sure but in general we can divide neurotransmitters up into direct type neurotransmitters and these are going to be the type that bind to ligand channels and open up those channels. You can also have indirect ion channels and these are going to bind to G protein something we touched on early in this class. Basically what a G protein does is it binds something to the outside and then to a cascade effect, it multiplies that signal up millions and millions of times so you can change a whole host of proteins or a whole host of processes inside the cell. Direct ion channel receptors are things like amino acid. It's like GABA and glycine, which tend to have inhibitory effects, which means they are going to bind to which type of channel. They're going to either let chloride come in or let potassium leave. There's also NMDA and glutamates, these are going to have EPSB effects or stimulatory effects. 
So they're going to open sodium channels. There's acetylcholine as a major type of neurotransmitter. And just to make it more confusing, there's two different types of receptors. And one of them is a direct ion channel type neurotransmitter. And the other one responds indirectly through G-proteins. Nicotinic acetylcholine receptor is the receptor that receives the neurotransmitter from a motor neuron and stimulates muscle. Muscarinic, again, works through G-proteins. And this is a major receptor in the parasympathetic nervous system. You have neurotransmitters called biogenic amines, which are further divided into catecholamines like norepinephrine, epinephrine, and dopamine. And then you have indolamines like serotonin and histamine, which are related to things like mood. There's different peptides, so really small proteins. There's one that's called substance P that tends to increase pain, so if you injure something, you actually want more pain to that area sometimes. You want it to be hypersensitive so you don't use that region. Or it's also responsible for after you cut yourself and it swells and the area around the wound becomes more painful. That's something substance P is thought to do. Endorphins have the opposite effect. So you get like a runner's high or endorphins are thought to be given up in, in cases of extreme pain and they reduce pain. And then there's novel neurotransmitters like carbon monoxide, nitrous oxide, and ATP. So that's the neurotransmitters. So that's the umbrella metaphor and basically I'm hoping that if you look at each individual chapter in this metaphor, they're fairly simple. The difficulty is, is putting them all together and making it make sense as to how neurons make decisions. And the first step of that is just how it makes sense in terms of the umbrella metaphor. And the next step is can you apply it to basically other decisions that your brain makes whether it's a line that's vertical or horizontal, whether it's this word or that word, how do you apply these decisions to keep your car moving straight down the road? Or even more complex decisions about, do I go out to dinner tonight or do I go to class? On the test, I definitely would like you to come up with your own decision-making process. Don't just copy, do I take an umbrella today? And try and be a little bit more creative than, do I take a coat today? A common one is, do I go to class today? Again, you should be able to extend this metaphor up into higher order conscious decisions like what are my political affiliations, what are my goals in life, how do I choose my friends, to simple cognitive processes like reading and turning left and following directions and things like that. Or how do I feel right now? Do I feel like an idiot and I need to listen to this darn thing again? Or do I feel brilliant? Which is what I'm hoping for. Because you see that at the very base level of consciousness, neurons make decisions. And the processes are pretty simple, although they add up to pretty complex behavior. Or maybe you just go take a nap.